and I wanted to first welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I want to share a couple of statistics that many of you probably already know. Uh, that is 30 to 40 percent of all the food in the United States gets wasted. One out of nine Americans are food insecure, meaning they lack consistent access to food for a healthy life. How can we reduce food waste and divert food waste to the needy? That was the primary question driving five strangers to work together and bring you today's events. Five of us came together as part of an effort from the Uniting for Action America program. It's a program that's being implemented by Urban Rural Action, the News Literacy Project, Women of Color Advancing Peace, Security, and Conflict Transformation, and by Bridge People. My name is Kami Akivan. I'm zooming in today from Torrance, California. I'll be joined by my fellow Uniting for Action program participants, Stephen Carmody from Chicago, Illinois, Shanae Simon from Memphis, Tennessee, Corey Walsh from Washington, DC, and Greta Zaro from Unadilla, New York. We all welcome you to today's panel discussion and our subsequent breakout rooms. You're soon gonna meet our esteemed panelists as Shanae leads their panel-based conversation. Please use the chat feature to input your questions, your comments all throughout the discussion. Uh, we hope that this feels like a discussion, so chime in anytime, all the time. Greta is gonna pose your questions to our panelists and lead the Q&A segment. Stephen's gonna conclude the formal proceedings and lead us into informal breakout rooms for networking and further conversation. We're gonna to be together for about the next 90 minutes. So thank you so much for joining us today. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Shanae Simon, who will then introduce our esteemed panelists. Shanae, the floor is yours. Awesome. Thank you, Kami, for that warm introduction. And thank you, everyone, for joining us this afternoon, this evening, um, for you to join us. Uh, because we're talking about food, I hope you have a snack or a drink nearby. Uh, that We want this to be a conversation where we're sitting at the table. So we're at the table. Um, having conversation is new friends and family in this food fight um, for food justice. And so we'll take a few minutes to hear from each of our panelists. Um, our panelists are representing various cities and communities across the U.S. We have California at the table, we have Memphis, Tennessee, we have a U.S. national organization as well as Pennsylvania. So we're very glad to have everyone seated at the table with us today and looking forward to a very rich and engaging dialogue. I would first like to um, invite to the table to speak is Jay. I'm from Pennsylvania. Um, through your introduction, Jay, if you could just share your name, a little bit about your organization and how the mission of your organization relates to food security, food waste, food justice. Thank you. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Jay. I have worked for a community action agency that is um, first and foremost um, anti poverty focused. And I coordinated a program called the Gleaning Project um, to address a small part of that to um, recover excess produce from local farms and get that to people that can't afford that fresh local produce otherwise. Um, the way that our organization thought about that process was to first um, connect our community um, to then be able to make the best use of agricultural excess um, to then reduce food insecurity and improve community health. Um, so I think just in introducing myself, I think that first priority um, around um, connecting a community is probably the most integral thing to our success that it wasn't as simple as logistics um, and um, and ultimately our goals weren't going to be achieved um, alone. Thank you, Jay. And now would welcome Tim, I mean, Memphis, Rashawn, Rashawn from the works. Good afternoon, thank you for having, having me. Um, I'm Rashawn Austin, the president of the Works Incorporated and it's a community development corporation that's Memphis space. And I guess a lot of people wonder, why am I in this conversation around food? And I'll tell you how we got here. And so we were mostly a housing developer of affordable housing units, both multifamily and single family for rental and home ownership. Uh, about 12 years ago, our organization uh, at its 10th year anniversary decided to go undergo a very extensive neighborhood planning effort. 
And for 18 months, uh, we talked to our neighbors, the residents in the area and other stakeholders about priorities. And one theme uh, that kept coming up uh, once we discovered the nine pro what the nine priorities were was food, food access and food security or food insecurity. And so it got us started in the food space. And our first initiative in food was around our farmer's market, the South Memphis farmer's market, which is entering its 12th season uh, in late May, early June. Uh, then it led us to getting some federal funding and starting a grocer because we're a food desert and our closest grocery stores were 2.3 miles and uh, 2.5 miles respectively away from our center of our neighborhood. And so we started a small corner store size grocery uh, and entered the world of nutrition education using the Cooking Matters curriculum, which one of the focuses is on um, minimizing waste. Uh, it's about nutrition, budgeting, and minimizing waste. Uh, and so we operated that curriculum for seven years and have gotten all over the food space in the grocery business, starting a mobile grocery soon uh, that will go into other neighborhoods uh, outside of our South Memphis neighborhoods that don't have access to food. Uh, and we've also been a lender in the space, uh, spending about 1.2 million on grocery stores. And so Although our focus is not solely on food waste, uh, we do have to address it because the population we're de dealing with, and just to kind of give you an idea about our central zip code in Memphis 3106, we have the lowest life expectancy. Uh, we have some of the lowest, lowest income. So we are second in line in terms of poverty uh, in zip codes in our county. Um, and our life expectancy is the lowest in the county. I just mentioned that. And it's by 13 years and people don't really think about that. So we live 13 years less than the people in our same county in a, in a separate zip code. Uh, and so food has become a big part of our work and it's not disconnected from housing because just how grocers place is around, retail's place around rooftops. And so our work in community development is very connected to our access to food. And in our work, even in housing, we talk about food being one of the top five expenses for any household, and including housing and all housing expense utilities, food, transportation, and depending on your household, medicine and uh, childcare. And speaking of food waste and medicine, we also have a very robust health and wellness initiative in our neighborhood being that we have the lowest life expectancy, but we have a high incidence of uh, preventative diseases. Thank you, Rashawn. I now invite Tamara. Hello, thank you for inviting me to be here. I'm representing Cooperation Humboldt, which is located in the far Northern coastal portion of California. It's a very rural area and we have the third highest rate of food insecurity in the entire state of California. Um, and what Cooperation Humboldt is, is a social change organization. We are a 501c3 and we exist to create a solidarity economy in this region. And what we mean by a solidarity economy is an economy where everyone has their needs met without anybody being exploited and without harming the environment, but with actually working to restore natural balance. So we work in several different areas meant to address all areas of human need, everything from arts and culture to housing, to economic democracy, care and wellness, um, and including food. And food is the area that I'm the most passionate about and the most active with um, in the community and with our organization. So the fundamental belief of our food team is that nutritious and culturally appropriate food is a fundamental human right and one that must be provided to everyone regardless of wealth or income. So everything that we do is based on that understanding and that conviction. And um, We've only been doing this work for a few years. Uh, when we got started, we spent some time assessing and understanding what already exists in the community because we certainly don't want to duplicate efforts and we want to lift up and amplify the great work that's already being done toward those goals. 
uh, the, the projects that we created um, were in response to where we felt like the gaps were. And so those ended up being, I think, really related to um, kind of personal and community empowerment, uh, getting folks the skills that they need to meet more of their own needs themselves and more of the needs of their immediate families and communities. Um, and I can, I think that I'll have a chance to talk more about what those projects are um, later in the program. Thank you, Tamara. Welcome. And now passing um, the mic to Melissa. Hi, everyone. I'm Melissa Speisman. I'm with Food Rescue US. Uh, Food Rescue US is a national nonprofit founded in 2011 to reduce food waste and address food insecurity. As Cami said, uh, over 40% of our food supply, hang on one second, over 40% of our food supply, technical difficulties, over 40% of our food supply is wasted every year. And the number used to be 40 million Americans. And in 2020, that number rose to over 50 million Americans. So 50 million Americans found themselves food insecure in 2020. And so there's certainly not a lack of food, but lack of the logistics necessary to connect fresh food with people in need. We especially saw this during the past year while the supply chains were disrupted and they were turned upside down. Growers didn't know what to do with the produce they were growing and distributors didn't know where to put the food that was being turned back to them by shuttered restaurants. Food Rescue US has a really simple solution we provide the platform to enable individuals and organizations to serve their communities in reducing food waste and hunger using our best-in-class technology. What makes our model unique is we are volunteer-driven, so that means that all of our food is moved by volunteers, technology-powered, all of the work that we do is powered by our technology platform, Direct transfer, all of our food is moved from point A to point B with no stops or warehousing in the middle. And we have a very cost-effective model. We can provide, for every dollar we receive, we can provide 11 meals through our recovery work. Since 2011, we've delivered over 56 million meals. And since launching in 2011, we've expanded to 36 locations in 20 states and the District of Columbia. By reducing food waste, we are addressing th three societal issues. Nutrition, so access to healthy foods definitely increases productivity and cuts down on disease. Childhood development, it's definitely been proven that children perform better at school when they're well nourished and they go on to higher education and break cycles of poverty. And then needless to say, by reducing food waste and getting food to people in need, we are reducing the methane gas that harms the environment. During our COVID response, we continued our core operations and we launched three new initiatives, the community kitchen program where we had restaurants, keeping restaurants open, keeping their employees employed, and getting meals out to communities, meal programs where we were doing a similar model where we were provide, purchasing meals from restaurants so they could stay open and keep their employees engaged, delivering those out to the communities. And then we participated not only in the USDA Farmers to Families program, but in farm distributions, helping farmers get their produce off of their farms. Food Rescue US will continue to expand throughout the country. We have, again, 36 locations, some of them individuals running our locations and some of them other organizations that are using our platform. We'll continue to enhance and upgrade our technology. And we have a goal to strengthen our thought leadership position, position throughout the US. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you all. Um, as we have been able to introduce that we have subject matter experts, practitioners, activists, advocates across the country. And it was really imperative to our work group that we had representation, as much representation as we could secure, to know that food is not just a, a local issue. It's not just a regional issue. It's not a state issue. It's a national issue. 
and that each state, each city, each organization has a, a different way of addressing that issue because each community is different. And I love it how each of our panelists have already highlighted that they've been able to meet a need based on the, um, meet a need and also a niche based upon the community they're serving. They've been listening to the community and saying, how can we best serve? How can we best support and address this issue? So again, thank you all so very much. And what a pleasure it is to have Food Rescue US a part of the conversation as an organization that's combating this with technology. So bringing food and technology together to work together. And so we thank you for sharing that expertise with us during this conversation as well, Melissa. So I will start with the questions and we'll first begin with a question directed to Food Rescue. Um, Melissa, with Food Rescue US, uh, your work is primarily focused on rescuing food from what is going to waste, whether it is at farms or at the grocery store or at a conference center and delivering it for free to communities in need. How has your organization leveraged technology to help you achieve these goals at scale? Thank you. Food Rescue US was founded in 2011 with the intention that it would always be a technology platform. We were founded by a software developer who understood and saw that there was food waste happening at every level. He was reading about what was happening on farms. He was seeing what was happening in his local restaurants. And he figured he needed to devise a technology platform that worked through the logistics of bringing food from where it would be wasted to where it would be needed most without incurring the cost of trucking and warehousing. So we developed a software platform that allows us to connect our volunteers with opportunities for picking up food donation and bringing it to receiving agencies. Because of our technology platform, it has made us very easy to grow around the country because we've been able to provide our technology platform to other organizations who are either doing food recovery or also already or um, start, starting food recovery programs. It's very easy to bring them on the platform. It's very easy for them to adapt their work to our platform, download all of their information. Our volunteers find it very easy to use and um, it's a very impactful platform for volunteers to be able to, within a half hour, pick up food and deliver it and see that it's having that sort of an impact in their community. We're able to provide metrics for our donors, our receiving agencies, and our locations on the amount of food that they are donating and receiving, the value of that food, and what's the meal equivalent of that. Um, as I mentioned in my intro, we will continue to develop our technology platform, and we really want to understand what the needs of our communities are. I think everybody has kind of mentioned, um, you know, the communities that are being served by all of our solutions and all of the work that we do are compromised in a lot of ways. And one of the things that we found is, even at the organization level, they don't have the resources necessary to um, develop out their programs in as much as understanding what their needs are. Do they really need bananas or are they really in need of fruit and, you know, fruit and dairy? Uh, Rashawn talked about um, life expectancy. We're really looking to learn about what are the needs of the communities that we're serving? Again, what types of food they need. And the agencies that we're serving don't have the ability to learn that or work with that data on their own. So we're looking to build models into our platform to help us understand that. Excellent, thank you for sharing that, Melissa. Thank you. And I would love to get our participants involved just a little bit by just using your uh, one of your, your, either your thumb to say yes or no. But I would love to know from our audience, how many folks are even familiar with the Food Rescue US app? Um, and if you're familiar with it or have you used it? Um, so if you have, or if you've tried, or if you heard about it, I'd love to hear, see a thumbs up. Um, and it would encourage you like at the conclusion of today to think about downloading that application. Um, again, because it is using technology and food. So thanks, Joe, I saw your thumbs up. And Stephen, thanks. Um, keep the thumbs coming up if you're familiar with it. The next question I would like to pose is to Jay. So Jay, what do you think about emerging trends and business opportunities that can help reduce food waste and advance food justice? And how does this relate to the work of the Gleaning Project? I think that, I think in my experience, it's really hard to do those two things at the same time. 
specifically justice. Um, I think it's possible to tie food waste reduction and food insecurity reduction together. Um, you can you can use technology, you can use logistics, <clears throat> you can use community relationships to get food moved around um, a little bit more efficiently and a little bit more um, you know specifically and kind of targeted. Um, but I think. Um, expecting food waste reduction to advance food justice is a really tall order. Um, I think that the opportunities to reduce food waste are apparent, and I think there's a lot of expertise in this room and across the country um, with organizations like Melissa's working um, for that there is interest, there's awareness of the 30 to 40 percent number, um, there's, there's some investment dollars, there are technology platforms um, that have been developed over the last 10 years, and so I think I think all of those opportunities bode well for food waste reduction and for some food insecurity reduction. I think, though, that food insecurity is a function more um, of uh, a lack of justice than a lack of um, adequate food supply. And so uh, the opportunities to advance food justice um, are are different from those opportunities to um, to reduce food waste. I think. To advance food justice, it takes um, representation in local, state, and federal government. It takes engagement in public policy, um, which is a pain. I don't know. Can I say? I don't know. Well, I won't. Which is a pain in the butt. Um, it's really, really, really hard. It's really, really hard. And um, and I think uh, opportunity food justice or justice generally takes funding um, that is equity focused. And I don't know. <clears throat> I don't know how. I don't know how you can do all those things all at the same time. And so I think having coordination of efforts um, that that tech platforms that are working on in logistics are part of the conversation, but are not looked to as a solution. I, I just don't I hope that I'm in a room with friends and I can and I can and I can say freely that I just don't think that I, I don't and I have limited experience. So I look forward. I look for um, pushback, too. Um, that I, I don't know how, um, how a tech platform can, can advance justice. I think it can be part of the discussion and address symptoms in the meantime, but for folks that really want to see change, that takes, uh, government, <laughs> um, not necessarily government providing all things, because maybe we'll have different, you know, different, um, opinions about the best way to, um, run a society. Um, but, but I don't know. Yeah. I, I, I just don't know how we can reduce food waste and advance food justice at the same time. But I've only been doing this for five or ten years, um, and and we're 13 months into a pandemic, so maybe my imagination is limited right now. No, I appreciate your honesty, Jay, and I think those were some of the same. Uh, th that's some of the things that we kind of tackled with as a as a group when coming to this point of having a discussion, right? Like. Could you have a con can you have a conversation about food insecurity, food security, food sovereignty, food waste, and not include food justice? And is it important to have all of these terms at the table so that we can begin to better understand all of these words, what they mean, how they relate to one another, and knowing that one or two, it may one, it's not going to be one plus two is going to equal three. I think there needs to be one happening while another one is happening, and at some point it kind of intersects at some point together, but. I, I totally appreciate your honesty. And I just hope that today through this conversation, we are among friends and that we're talking this, this is a conversation, right? That we're talking and that we have an opportunity to talk on this panel as well as in breakout groups. I think you bring up a very good point. And so I don't know if there are any other panelists that would like to respond kind of to what he's posed um, just for a few moments. Um, I would love to hear some other perspectives on this before we move on to the next question. Go for it, Tamara. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that perspective that Jay shared, and um, it brought up a few things for me. And one of them is, you know, just to circle back to what I described as the solidarity economy. One of the principles of a solidarity economy is pluralism, um, meaning that there's not any one single way to a solution, and it's going to take a bunch of different things happening all at the same time. Um, and another metaphor that we really love at Cooperation Humboldt is that of the imaginal cells. Um, I don't know if you've heard this before, but um, when, a, when a caterpillar is turning into a butterfly and it goes into the cocoon, it actually completely like 
dissolves as a caterpillar and the cells refind each other and the cells for the eyes find each other and become an eye and the cells for the wings come together and find a wing. And um, we really see that as the way that like this, this movement and this social change has to happen um, is that everything's kind of coming apart and coming back together and in a totally new way. And so what's happening in Memphis and what's happening, um, you know, in Austin and what's happening in California are all these imaginal cells that are starting to need to link together and come together in that way. So those are my thoughts. I like that. Um, I like that, Tamara. I just want to chime in because sometimes you need different metaphors depending on your audiences. Oh, you, you said you're pretty rural. We're pretty rural over here too um, in cent central Pennsylvania. And so when I would talk about the Gleaning Project, um, trying to get, get this thing off the ground, um, I, would, um, I would talk about the Gleaning Project in, in all its amazingness as I wanted to tout it um, was not going to be the silver bullet um, because that didn't exist. Um, but, but what we were looking for was silver buckshot. Um, and if we could all head in the same direction, um, do, doing our own things, then, then maybe we'd, um, we'd make some progress here. Thank you both for that. And thank you for the comments coming in in the chat as well. Uh, Rashawn, I now invite you, uh, being that your comment coming from a uh, urban environment, um, both Jay and Tamara um, spoke about kind of a rule, which I appreciate them highlighting that as well. Again, that was part of uh, the call and urban rural action of how we bring in urban and rural communities together. Um, so I would love for you to share a comment, if you would, maybe from perspective, from an urban perspective, based on kind of this beginning conversation. And then I have another question to pose to you. Okay, so I, I wanted to respond to Jay. I'm, I'm down, Jay. <laughs> I, I agree. Uh, and, and looking at some of the comments from or questions from Julie in the chat, very interesting. And I don't necessarily view food uh, as, as something different uh, in the urban setting than it is in the rural setting. And uh, Julie was saying in the chat a, a question only about food justice food justice is related to economic justice, racial justice, gender justice, on and on and on and on. And in, in, a, in the US, and this is probably true in uh, most um, Western societies, uh, how we determine where we place food, you know, we may grow food, food in the rural areas. Uh, and in Memphis is weird because of our proximity <laughs> to where we grow food as a, a city. Um, because we so our background is so agrarian. Uh, and so we have food right around us, which is scary because the farms are nearby in our same county within miles of us. And we still have food insecurity problems. But the way we've established our food systems and how we disperse food is, and I mentioned it earlier, is based on uh, the retail model is based on a density of population. And so th that's where grocery stores place, that's where markets place, so that people can then purchase food from those places. Our residents in the center of the city who have a lack of transportation, so we can add that transportation justice on uh, to that and housing justice, because they're all tied together. And so that's why a housing agency uh, is in so involved in food work, uh, but I also like something Jay kind of alluded to around our government and policy uh, being uh, key uh, to just the justice side of our work. Uh, and you don't very often see our local bodies talking about food. They, they you, at, at just during the pandemic, you see a lot of elected officials, for instance, in Memphis, particularly our city and county, uh, our council people and our uh, commissioners on the county side, and even some of the state representatives hosting these uh, food giveaways uh, using the food from our uh, local food bank, the Miss South Food Bank. But um, it, so it's just kind of a band-aid approach to addressing food issues. Uh, and then what happens post-pandemic? Do we go back to not supporting our Miss South Food Bank? Uh, do people uh, no longer have access to giving away this food uh, that we're out, that we're wasting, uh, and there, there's no policy change associated with the food giveaways, uh, and so I am I'm very interested on the 
doing work on the justice side, what are they saying at the state level and, and how they allow us, and, I, and I, I can't not talk about development because how we're allowed to develop based on the way we disperse few, uh, food currently, uh, our zoning and zoning policies and our code enforcement uh, prohibits me from having a grocery store in my area because of exclusionary zoning. I can only build single family, so I don't have the density that retailers want uh, to bring in their markets because they can't survive. And so that's where I enter. Uh, how do I change housing policy so that I can address food? And then I address health and a uh, larger quality of life issues. Thank you for sharing that and highlighting that perspective, Prashan. Um, the next question I would like to pose to Corporation Humble, Tamara. Your organization works on a number of food-related initiatives, such as little, little food free pantries, free community, fruit trees, and free mini gardens, which are all similar in that they provide free food to people who need it. Tell us more about these programs and why your organization has chosen this particular approach in addressing food insecurity and what you see as a long-term strategy towards food security and food justice in your community. Thank you. So I just uh, shared a link in the chat to our food page on our website um, in case people would like to check it out later. And I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Because I would like to share this visual with folks. Um, we really try to be intentionally strategic um, in everything that we do here at Cooperation Humboldt. And so when we um, started to think about doing work around food, it was really important to us to actually work through goal strategies and tactics to make sure that we weren't just doing stuff. <laughs> I think a lot of um, social change organizations and individuals uh, jump into the work without really considering what the work should be and where it's aiming to get them. So we begin, you know, with our, our goal. And uh, like I mentioned, we do understand that access to nutritious and culturally appropriate food is a fundamental human right. And we're working to create a world where no one will go hungry due to lack of wealth or income. And we have an explicit goal to return this bioregion to the regenerative and life-sustaining food forest and ecological haven that it once was prior to colonialization, European colonial contact. Um, so only once we're clear on those goals, uh, do we start to move into strategies. And the strategies are outlined here from empowering residents with materials and skills to grow more, more of their own food, creating structures for resource sharing, partnerships, just straight growing more food. And then a big piece for us is shifting community consciousness around food. We actually have an explicit um, strategy of trying to make headway on shifting the public's understanding of food from a commodity to a fundamental human right. So once we get past the strategies, then is when we start to talk about tactics and then the tactics are the actual work that we're doing on the ground. So we have our little free pantries, which are these blue boxes. Um, we've established so far 25 of these boxes in neighborhoods um, in the greater Humboldt Bay area, and they serve as neighborhood hubs for sharing. Anyone can leave non-perishable foods and personal care items in there, and anyone can take what they need 24 hours a day. So um, this is, re is reminding me of your silver bullet versus silver buckshot an analogy, Jay, but um, you know we do have a really great food bank here, and we're not trying to undercut them or compete with them or um, in any way, you know, stop what they're doing or change what they're doing. But what we're trying to do is find these places where we can add to. Um, and this is adding to in that uh, it reduces some stigma um, and some issues around access to food banks uh, because they're available 24 hours a day, because they're located in communities, because people constantly see their neighbors stopping and putting things in and taking things out. It's normalizing sharing. It's creating, you know, connections in the community. Um, my personal experience with the Little Free Pantry at my home, I had recently moved into this house 
And um, I can say that I uh, we put our, our little free pantry about six months after we moved in, and I had more substantive conversations with neighbors and people in my local, my immediate vicinity within two weeks of installing the pantry than I had had in six months leading up to that time. So it goes so far beyond the, the charity aspect of sharing food for people. Um, they really have become hubs in the neighborhoods where they exist um, and started to shift the conversation about who who needs and who takes and who gives and that it can you can be all of the above. Um, so that's one of our projects. And if anybody's interested in any of these later, you can come here to the website and click on any of these links and there's more information. So I'm not going to go in the order that it's shown here, but um, the next thing we kind of launched into chronologically after the free pantries was our Food Not Lawns program. So we would uh, bring a group of volunteers on a Saturday or a Sunday and spend a half a day helping to convert somebody's unused front lawn into a productive garden, including edible plants, medicinals, and native plants. And that was great. It was like really wonderful for involving volunteers. It was impactful because it's front facing. We would put signs in the yard and it's part of this whole like shifting consciousness around food. Uh, and yet the whole time that we were doing that project, you know, for about a year, I was having some reservations about um, whether that was actually getting the resource to the people who needed it the most, because it was working mostly with, well, exclusively with people whose housing was very secure, mostly homeowners, but some renters. Uh, and I, I, I did have a concern that that wasn't truly getting the food resources to the people maybe who needed it the most. So when the pandemic hit, that actually was the final push to kind of shift our main focus on food growing um, to our mini gardens project. Um, so when the pandemic hit, probably by April, we were fully in mini garden mode. And what that is, is um, these fabric planter bags. They're about three and a half feet across. And uh, some people built wood ones, but mostly we use the fabric ones. Um, and our volunteers uh, would come and deliver them. Low income residents could sign up. They self-identify if they're low income. There's no uh, requirement um, for documentation or anything. Uh, and our volunteers would come and set up a complete um, mini garden for them, including the planter and good quality soil and all the starts and, you know, tomato cages and everything that's needed. And then also leave people with the information that they need to be successful in growing those foods. So that was a big accomplishment for us last summer. Between April and October, we installed 260 mini gardens in our first year uh, for low income residents. And we're looking at hopefully doing twice that this year. Um, we also plant three community fruit trees. Uh, we should be passing the 150 fruit tree mark by the end of this month. Um, so those are planted in publicly accessible locations throughout the community, oftentimes in folks' front yards, but also at schools, churches, community centers. And the people who receive the fruit trees actually sign an agreement saying that they agree to make that food, that fruit available to anybody who wants it. And when the fruit trees mature and start pr uh, producing fruit, we'll return and add a sign to it. And they've agreed that that's okay. So people actually know that that food is available to them. So that's, um, again, another element of shifting consciousness around food in kind of a public facing way. And the last thing that I'll touch on is uh, our community food guide. This was a resource that existed in our community for the last four years as the local food guide under the guidance of a different local nonprofit. Uh, it had been run completely on volunteer time and effort and it's a huge project. It's, a, it's an annual print publication. It's a magazine that comes out once a year and it has information about local food and the benefits of eating local food. It has information about reducing food waste, but in the most of it was um, directories of local food producers. And so we've taken that over for the first time and that's kind of been our winter project this year. It's almost finished and it'll be going to the printer by the end of this month. And we're really proud of what we've been able to bring to it. Um, we've brought a much stronger uh, food justice and food sovereignty lens and really committed to centering the voices of our local indigenous populations around food sovereignty issues um, and including a lot more information about the intersections of social justice and food. So 
that's coming soon. And this link will in about a month have, you know, more information with links to all those articles and everything. So I'm gonna stop sharing. Um, I'm just gonna look back Thanks, at the panel Anna. question. Is there anything I didn't cover? Tell us more yeah. about these programs. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That was great. That was a lot. <laughs> that was. Thank you. Very great. I want to. I uh, want to just highlight and pause for a moment that uh, there are quite a few words that come along with food. Um, we've heard now food justice, food sovereignty, food insecurity, food waste, all these great food words. Um, I would love for us to take a few moments just to kind of um, educate, just kind of like a little bit about just kind of what those words mean. Um, I know that I, I know of another word I've heard recently in my Memphis community is food. Um, food apartheid. And so it's all of these words and their meanings and how these words, I mean, how do we get basic understanding of educating people about these different words? And so I would love to kind of hear from each of the panelists kind of the words that are most frequently used by your organizations and giving a little bit of context as why those words versus or combination words versus another combination. And Tamara, do you mind? Oh, go ahead, Melissa. I was gonna say, Tamara, would you chime in, use food sovereignty to kind of educate in terms of that word and why that word is used uh, within your organization and community? Yeah, I'm just, um, I, I have a great resource to answer that. Um, and it actually comes from uh, an article that introduces our upcoming food guide uh, written by a local indigenous scholar. Um, and, so she writes, uh, at the heart of food sovereignty is the self-determination of individuals, communities, and groups over their food system. The declaration of Nialeni, I hope I'm saying that right, defines food sovereignty as the right of peoples to healthy and culturally appropriate food produced through ecologically sound and sustainable methods and their right to define their own food and agriculture systems. And um, that declaration also lists six principles of food sovereignty, and I can post this in the chat, but it's focused on food for people, valuing food uh, providers, localizing food systems, making decisions locally, building knowledge and skill, and working with nature. So I think that's the best definition of food sovereignty that I've seen, and I'm going to paste it in the chat right now. Awesome. Thanks, Tamara. Would anyone else like to chime in on this? You know, I don't know if we ever use those words uh, <laughs> uh, outside of groups like this, uh, people who are in the work. And, uh, but when we're dealing with our neighbors, our residents, uh, our housing, we never use words like even food access or food insecure or food sovereignty or food justice. Um, we just talk about what their needs are in, a, in very uh, simple language you know if there's hunger they understand that and how do we keep them from being hungry uh, how do they access food um, and and one of the things that hasn't come up and I was just listening to all, everyone else um, is how we communicate uh, with people who are not academics who are not um, in our spaces uh, about food justice or food apartheid or food sovereignty. Um, we, we often, and I think Sinead, we talked about this uh, in um, low income communities, our, our first go-to mostly um, is to say, how do they grow their own food? And so I'm thinking of my tenants, like why are they, why do they have to become farmers? Because we're unjust in distributing food as a society. Uh, if they are working two jobs in order to pay their rent, or as someone mentioned their, uh, I think it was Tamara, uh, their housing insecure. And so they, they don't know if they're gonna be in this place, uh, even if, if it's a single family residence for uh, any amount of time, particularly during the pandemic when we have so many people who are being forced to move, they can no longer pay the rent. Even with the moratoriums, they're, they're, in Memphis, we have um, a large rental base that is single family detached. And so those are small landlords uh, that are not necessarily 
making themselves subject to uh, <laughs> the CDC's moratorium. Uh, and they're not going through the courts to put people out, and but that doesn't mean people are not out uh, out of their homes. Uh, and so I, I like to start having discussions with the people that we serve and how do they speak about this and how do they address this? And I, I think about one of our apartment communities. And so they don't say these words, but they make sure that none of their neighbors are hungry. Uh, and so it, it's kind of an old fashioned way of thinking they still go next door to borrow an egg or a cup of sugar. Uh, or if one lady cooks, she feeds those who have been unemployed. And at this point, now they know that we give food because okay, we have a store and we do our own giveaways, which we've always done. Um, but our, our resident will call the management office and say, I'm hungry. Um, can I get a bag or two or three of grocery? And so then she gets on the line with our grocery manager and says, Mr. Jones in apartment 101, building four is hungry in these groceries. And so then we pack the grocery and take it to Mr. Jones. He doesn't have to come to us. Um, we pack it and take it to them. But I think some of our conversations need to expand to include people who are not academics, who are not working in agencies, who do not understand these words. They just know that they need access to food and that they're hungry and that we live in a wealthy nation. Uh, and, you know, they, they, they can't get involved. They, they're literally working. It takes them two hours to get back and forth to work uh, because they don't have a private automobile. So they have to use the, our public transportation system. And in Memphis, that's a bad thing. And I'm sure that's probably true in, in rural uh, <laughs> counties also. We feel like we're in a rural county because it could take uh, someone on a bus an hour to get 15 minutes if they would just to take a bike. Uh, it, they have to go out of the way and make a transfer to get downtown from South Memphis. And we're only 10 to 15 minutes away via a bicycle. And so I, I wanted these conversations to expand to include the people that we're talking about who don't have that access. Well said, Rashawn. Thank you for that. And this last question is for you. Um, I think uh, when you talk about that, I think you're absolutely right about how we communicate that and how do we, how do we include that conversation um, and to walk alongside um, and not coming in as saviors. If we can save your neighborhood, we can do this for you. But really asking, how can we, how can we walk alongside you? How can we show? What need of yours can we meet? What do you want? And what do? How do you want us to show up for you? I think that's very important. With along those lines, when you think about initiatives like the Promise Zone Initiative, or more recently the Spark Initiative of you know sustainable and resilient communities, um, and how you know this uh, certain cities get this designation. Um, I know that Memphis has recently got the designation of being a Spark, you know, Spark City. Um, I'm, I mean, maybe some of these other, I'm not sure if they had the Promise Zone um, designation, but I know like for instance, San Antonio, we have a participant from San Antonio, but how do you believe that organizations that may not be a part of these specific initiatives that are government related, how can they again be also amplify their organizations and amplify the work that they're doing and kind of get that recognition? Like I know for you, the work specifically, like you were featured in that, uh, was it called The Great Divide, that film that kind of brought light to kind of the stories and things that were happening here in Memphis? or other organizations or other communities that don't have those designations and may not have that spotlight, kind of what would you, I guess, um, recommend in terms of what would you like to see for those communities to be able to amplify what's going on for their stories to be shared? And then also how those initiatives have, can also be helpful, but maybe also a hindrance to addressing these issues. And so initiatives can be very hindering, <laughs> especially if they're top down from agencies out of Washington or in that instance, it was, um, the um, guardian uh, contacted me to talk about uh, in their divided city series about Memphis and um, food access and food hu and hunger. Really, it was about hunger, and so I spent a week with them, taking them around Memphis. But agencies like the works, we we can't depend on me and my staff to be. I mean, although we do go door to door. We need to take those smaller organizations, those grassroots organizations who are really in the midst of um, the people who live and need access to food um, 
and and bring them into our fold and instead of doing the opposite of what we tend to do with those big initiatives like uh, even SPART, which was is meant to be uh, with grassroots organizations. We've not seen a lot of success with SPARC locally. Uh, and you don't really see anything coming of the conversations that they're having. And I think it's because you don't get buy-in. You know, so one of our ways of getting buy-in on anything we do, uh, whether it's us building a pocket part, we didn't say, let's build a pocket part. We said, we have land. We've had it for 20 years. What do you dream about? <laughs> you know, what do you think this can be uh, in this location? And so they dream wildly. I mean, we can't afford everything they dream up, but <laughs> they dream up something. That then led to us as a community going to a funding source versus the funding source coming to us and saying, these are the areas we've decided on. Now you just need to fight over uh, <laughs> who's going to get the money and get to implement it. Uh, we went to them and said, this is what we would like to do. And this is why it fits into what you fund. Uh, and so our, our State Department of Health, and it's, it's weird, we were able to get under the Department of Health Diabetes uh, Prevention Grant to build a pocket park. That doesn't seem to match, but it's what our neighbors said. They, they do have a high incidence of diabetes. They don't have access to food. And so we were able to get $450,000 to build a pocket park on land we own that they designed. Uh, and so I, I think we just have to change our way of thinking. So we, we were successful with several grants in that way, you know, with a Nas the National Council on Aging and our local foundation with the Aging Mastery Program because they decided, they told us what they needed versus, you know, and I, for, I've been in this work for about 25 years or so. And one of my first initiatives was un under the Ford Foundation, the Neighborhood and Family Initiative. And it was a comprehensive pro approach of looking at neighborhood redevelopment. And it didn't work. You know, so 25 years later, whatever happened to NFI in the cities where they uh, placed that initiative? Because it did not involve the people who would it, it would impact most. Uh, they said they did, but they got the what they considered the top people, the academics at our local university, um, you know, the anthropology department, and I came out of the anthropology department, um, and they didn't talk to everyday Joe because they were at work, and they didn't even hold the meetings at a time that he could come. So, you know, so we have, we have our meetings in the evening when people are off work. We feed them. We provide them with child care. <laughs> and, and so then the conversation changes. Um, and so we are really then connecting them to what they need. And I use the example of our register in our store. We don't say, oh, let's buy through our supplier 20,000 bananas and assume that's what people want to eat. Now our register tells us what they want to eat. So we know that we have customers that come in and I like the data driven approach Melissa was talking about. We look at the register on Mondays at noon 10 people come in and they buy pears. And so that's what we supply. We supply what they say they want. We have four residents in our neighborhood who shop every Wednesday and they have gout. So they buy tart cherry juice. So we always have those four bottles of tart cherry juice. And so we start as a store eliminating how we waste because we are planning based on what they told us they need. Thank you, Rashawn, um, and thank you, everyone. I have one final question, and we'll then turn it over to Greta. And no, everyone has kind of shared their models, and we kind of touched on this earlier, just about um, when we talk about food justice, that we think about the government um, and our and our political system. Um, and everyone's models that kind of were shared today, I don't see that kind of as a as a player, um, as a part of that equation. And so I would love to kind of close everyone with that in terms of has there been success. Um, has there not been success when kind of inviting uh, policy and elected officials to the table? Um, and I think also about like food councils. Again, I don't, some people have heard pros and cons like, oh yeah, it's been great. Or yes, we host this meeting and yes, the city said they wanted to have it, but they don't even show up. So I would love to kind of hear from everyone, our panelists in terms of how do we invite the policy to the table? How do we invite elected officials to the table? And if you have, 
how has that experience been? And kind of just speak from that. Jay, I see you smiling and nodding. So I'm going to start with you. <laughs> yeah, because I'm bad at it. I know it's needed and it's hard and I'm bad at it. And so I just I just need to say I fail at this and get, then get out of the way. I think um, I think policy is the biggest lever that we have to make the most impact for the most people. And um, I think it's the most important role that we should focus on. And I think that policy is also the most murky um, by default and by design. Um, it's the least immediate seeming priority in a world full of urgent needs. And all of us are trying to address urgent needs um, in, a, in a room on fire. And I think the, um, that it's also the most um, potentially uncomfortable thing um, or uh, because it means hurting feelings or it means speaking hard truths or it means you know having a having a difference of opinions um, or it means getting political uh, and I'm nice you know I don't want to argue I don't want to get with <laughs> I don't want I'm a nice I'm a nice people pleasing person that um, so so I'm not good at that you know I'm I'm trying to grow into that um, because I recognize after, um, <clears throat> you know, the limited experience that I've had that um, the, the work that I've done is insufficient and that policy is, is actually the way that the most sufficient change would happen. Um, I'm curious to hear what everybody else has to say. It's Melissa. Thank you for that, Jay. I think the most interesting thing that I think about policy is the policy question as the our overarching issues are, is so complicated and diluted because what part of policy are you looking to change, right? So we look at things like policy. So there are people working on, you know, doubling SNAP benefits at farmers markets. People are working at, you know, making grocery stores and restaurants have to donate their food. So what part of policy are we really thinking about? Is it you know, food deserts, it, it's crazy to think that food deserts can be solved by policy, like by allowing retailers or encouraging retailers or giving retailers resources to bring it to there. So I think that policy gets very complicated, but I do believe, Jay, to your point, it's, it's the place that, it's the only place where all of the systemic issues that we're talking about will be solved because we, you know, we're, we're all working very hard to change communities and change our specific communities. And we're doing a great job of building community and meeting the needs. But how do we go back a step and change? How did we get here? Melissa, I think you, you touched on a couple of things on the policy side, on the health and human services, it, it is, increasing access to SNAP benefits uh, for families, many of whom fall uh, outside of the current guidelines. Um, you know, for instance, we are self-funding uh, doubling SNAP purchases in our store um, for both seniors, many of whom don't receive SNAP. So we, we just double their purchases because they're a senior and they, they have a solo household, so they're not eligible and for families that receive SNAP. So it's a 20 for 20 purchase. So they're getting more food, but on the policy side, you know, my developers had, I mentioned how uh, grocers place based on rooftops. So if we have exclusionary zoning throughout the United States, uh, then we can't have dense neighborhoods and particularly in Southern cities that have expanded. And just to give you an idea Memphis, uh, grew 130% in land between 1960 and today. So we have 324 square miles of city. Our population did not keep up. So we may have had a 30% growth in population, but we grew 324 square miles. So our neighborhoods became even less dense. And so we see policy implications and funding implications through federal pass-through as a result, because we don't have density in our um, qualified census tracts, and it's a per capita uh, calculation uh, from HUD, for instance. Memphis gets $10 in a similarly sized city by population, not land, Detroit, 
gets $57. So they get almost six times in federal entitlement funds than we get. And so if we start changing our local and state policies around how we can build, because it's also prohibitive or I'm prohibited unless I pay for variances that I may or may not win uh, to build different housing types, uh, then I can't get a dense enough population for a store to place in the midst of my neighborhood, any kind of store, uh, definitely not a grocery store because you saw grocery stores grow and I always tell people they're like what happened to the mom and pops we had them before but we saw Sam's and Costco and Super Kmart all of those huge mega stores enter a business that put the mom and pop out and we can't ignore that uh, on the policy side so how do we get independence and the smaller grocers the mom and pops back into our neighborhoods and not the convenience stores that only sell, you know, the things that were in the Guardian video. I was like looking for something that looked like fruit. It was sort of red, but it was probably Kool-Aid or some soda. And so those things weren't there because the convenience store retailer has to buy at a retail. They don't, they don't supply at wholesale. So they got to market up a higher retail for the people that have the lowest incomes. This is the only thing they have access to. So you're killing them. Uh, by what you're selling them and, and you're selling it to them at a higher price than if they could get to a Sam's and maybe they would choose something different. And so we do have to address some policies that don't seem like they're food policies, but they are uh, because they're impacting our access to food because we don't have a dense enough population in a certain neighborhood. That's the excuse they've used. Uh, <laughs> And, and so we really have to address that. And there were some conversations at our state level a few years ago, but they kind of die out. It's, it's not, I say that about affordable housing. It's not a sexy enough topic, I suppose. And I'm thinking the two things that humans need most is a shelter and food. <laughs> so, but neither of those, pop, those uh, conversations are being had at our state, in our state houses or in our councils or in our commissions. And Jay, I'm not afraid at all uh, of elected officials. And I get involved in politics and I threaten. And I tell them, yeah, so we're gonna make sure you're a one-termer uh, because I do have so much influence with neighbors. And part of it is around uh, educating our neighbors about what our elected officials should be doing. I always tell them our city council spends 75% of their time on their agenda is around land use, whatever that land use is. And so you need to spend 75% of your time thinking about land use and not thinking about anything else. Our council will get caught up in schools. You're not the school system. We have school board members. You need to be talking about how do we use land because 63% of this county's budget is generated from the property tax. And so I am the agitator to remind them of what their jobs are and so that they can change the policy and impact change for the people who need it the most. I'll just interject real quick. Thank goodness, because um, white moderates like me or even recovering white moderates like me aren't insufficient. Um, and and we have to figure out how to work together, how to how to be supportive. Yeah. I can I can just share a couple of examples. Um, I I feel out of my element personally talking about policy, but I can give examples of how you know even as a five hundred one c three. Um, we've been able to do work in that area. And I think, um, I don't know if this is universal or uh, something specific to a more of a rural area and smaller nonprofits, but we've definitely run into a misconception among many of our partner organizations um, in the region that, they, that no nonprofits can engage in politics. And um, that's not exactly the truth. Um, we can't electioneer, we can't support a specific candidate, but there's so much that we can still do. And so we do kind of, we have kind of taken on the role of trying to like 
educate other community organizations about that and then work together with them on the things that we can do. So we've been a driving force at Cooperation Humboldt with um, bringing together a group of like a dozen local progressive leaning organizations to host uh, candidate forums for city council and for um, county supervisor candidates. In the past, the forums have always been hosted by more conservative leaning, you know, Rotary and that you know those kinds of groups so now we have a now we have something to balance it out we're hosting forums that are coming a little bit more from the other side of the aisle <laughs> and we're bringing together grassroots groups to put those on that's been one thing we've done um we also uh have been active participants in advocating for public banking in california and there's been some really exciting legislation passed around that lately so um, these are not food specific things but as we've been talking about the way that they're all connected um, public banking could be really huge um, and so that's at the california level which is large at a at a eureka city level which is small like we're a city of under forty thousand, i think but it is the county seat and the biggest city in our county um, we actually were successful just last year in um, helping to pass ranked choice voting for our city council. So we're one of just a few cities, I think, um, in California that now has ranked choice voting. And so that's a huge piece of people being able to actually have their vote count more than in um, single whatever the opposite of ranked choice voting is called, traditional voting. So um, yeah, those are a couple examples that come to mind for me of the work that Cooperation of Bolt has done in that area. Well, awesome. Thank you all. Um, I think we'll uh, this is our closing out on the um, panelists. Thank you so much. And I love the comments. We amplified it a couple of times that we need to have the pol political officials, elected officials at this conversation. They need to hear this. So maybe that's step two of us sitting this recording um, to some elected officials saying, hey, like, watch this. We need you involved. Um, and so I encourage our future uh, food group for URA that kind of maybe tackle that potentially. But thank you so very much, Melissa, Tamara, Jay, Rashawn. Um, truly humble to even share the screen with you today for you to share um, as we, as our group shared during our introductions that most, some of us were new to food. And so thankful to have met you along this food journey. Definitely feel inspired and educated um, by what you shared today. And hopefully that from you speaking among with your peers that you feel inspired. Um, to say something different, do something different, say something new, try something new. And so I now turn it over to Greta, who will kind of lead us in Q&A. And so Greta, I turn it over to you. So again, thank you to all of our panelists. Yes, thank you so much. Um, we have a couple of minutes for Q&A and then we will officially close this part and go into the breakout rooms. Um, so a question posed by Kami is, what would you do with an extra $20 million to advance your work in food? Um, or can another organization step in and provide the food, logistics, volunteers, technology, whatever it is you need that money uh, could solve or could not solve. Um, Kami says, I'm trying to understand your organization's pain points and how other organizations and we, the audience, can possibly help to address these pain points. Whoever wants to start. I mean, I'll, I have unearned confidence, so I'll, um, I'll throw something out there first. Um, I think I would, based on our policy conversation, I would invest in citizen education um, and, and grassroots organizing. Um, I bet $20 million could go a long way there to address those structural issues. Um, but I think the question though was more about what, what do these organizations need money for? They need money for staffing. They always need money for staffing. Um, every, every one of us uh, can get real creative with grant applications and figure out how to write in a little bit of extra money for staffing so that we can keep our, our critical staff, um, but, but, the, but the funding model of um, keeping admin costs really low, relying on philanthropy and grant funding generally to try to sustain an organization is, um, is a critical flaw. And so um, sustained funding so that, um, sustain sufficient funding for staff so that, um, so that there are good jobs in organizations like ours um, so that they can do the work they need to do and have healthcare you know, and maybe have a baby um, and be a part of the community so that they don't just have to hop onto the next thing so that they can then maybe go have a baby somewhere. Um, not, maybe I'm speaking out of turn, not that, um, not that family is the right choice for everyone, um, but just 
yeah, just, well, I guess I'll stop talking now. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I just want to um, piggyback on what Jay is saying, just because we just had a strategy session with our board this afternoon, and this very question came up, and our answer was exactly what Jay is saying now, is that funding is becoming impossible in models where our costs are actually very low because we rely on our volunteers and our tech, you know, we own our technology, but what we need to do is we need to expand. And the only way for us to expand is through being able to pay our people in communities to run these types of programs. And as Jay said, grant funding more and more, they're not interested in overhead costs. They're not interested in, in how they can on that they want to do something that they can put their name on that's you know a sexy and cool project and not really thinking about what what is the basis of what this is and how much further their fifty thousand dollars could go in somebody's salary rather than you know a program so if i had 20 million dollars because i'm a housing developer earn revenue uh i would have a chain of grocers similar to the one we operate in South Memphis with kitchens attached so we can do nutrition education. Um, and so we would start to eliminate uh, some of our food deserts. And so it would basically be a chain of mom and pop stores that are owned by their local communities and would hire um, people at livable wages to operate those stores. Um, and we probably finance uh, other healthy food initiatives, um, including those who want to farm uh, in their communities and do gardens um, and have orchards. And so we would put every penny uh, into those services and because our staff costs are supported by our other work, uh, the work where we earn our revenue. I love everything that everybody else has already said, and I'm right there with you, Jay and Melissa. Um, I mean, we're having the exact same conversation at Cooperation on Bolt. Um, it's really, really, really difficult to find ways to pay people who are doing this work equitably and provide benefits. Um, it's really hard to come up with that money. Uh, and I also think, um, you know, there can't, there can't be any equity without, without access to land. I mean, land is like foundational um, to folks being able to, to get ahead and to meet their needs. And so if I had a huge amount of money, it would definitely have to do with um, some land and, uh, and thinking about developing different ways of um, relating to the land. We're actually uh, working on some really different approaches right now in partnership with the Wiat tribe, which is our um, local ancestral territory um, tribe here around the Humboldt Bay, uh, where we're actually going to be doing um, uh, community ownership of land and public benefit projects where the Wiat tribe has a majority voice on approving or disapproving projects and where they're in land trusts that actually are going to result in long term community ownership. So that would be a piece of it for me with a lot of money. <laughs> Great, thanks everyone. I'll pose one more question. This one is from Julie, specifically for food rescue. Julie says, what are the challenges for rescuing food in rural areas given long distances? Is rescuing food easier or more feasible in urban spaces? Thank you for the question. And no, we've actually found it to be easier to rescue in rural areas. In urban areas, you're dealing with parking issues, congestion, moving food from point A to P, point B, overcrowding of space in rural areas where people can drive their cars and not get caught up in traffic. It's probably much easier to do it in a rural community than in an urban community. The only difference there would be in some urban communities, and this is happening, people are doing food rescue on bicycles and that's proven to be very effective. But we always say, you know, there's need everywhere 
and there's food waste everywhere. And if we can get someone to move it from point A to point B, there are no barriers for us to be in a community. Great, thank you so much. Okay, now I'm going to transition to Stephen to close us out and then transition us to breakouts. Thanks. Thanks, Karen. Uh, I'll, I'll keep it really quick because we are running a little uh, behind. I just wanna say thank you to everyone. Uh, it's been great to be a part of this group, the five of us on the food group, uh, that we were all strangers brought together by United for Action America. Uh, it was great to hear everyone and uh, talk about uh, their organizations and those that are watching and participating and to everyone who's watching and participating on this video in the future. Um, so we'll, uh, so just thank you. And we look forward to continuing these conversations, continuing this dialogue. We're gonna be sending out a follow-up email uh, that will have a survey and hopefully we'll be in contact uh, and continue contact in the future. So thanks everyone. Before we exit, we're gonna to go to breakout groups for about 10 minutes to allow for more dialogue and um, breakout communication and kind of getting to know one another. So it'll just be 10 minutes. Uh, Mariah has dropped in here kind of what the discussion points will be. Uh, we'll be paired up uh, with one panelist and then one member of our food group. So we hope that you can join us for a few moments in those breakout sessions. I um, mean, again, like Stephen said, the continue, this conversation is not to end here, but to continue beyond the, the breakout groups and beyond. So can you go ahead and break us out, Mariah?